So anyway, welcome uh, on this very beautiful uh, May morning to um, our Freedom to Write Commencement Forum, uh, which is also uh, a bright and sunny idea, even if sometimes interrupted by severe thunderstorms. My name is uh, Robert Coover. I came here to Providence 30-some years ago as a visitor. Uh, still a visitor, but I never quite got away. And I, partly because I found this town and university a hospitable place to exercise my own uh, freedom of expression, not to everybody's pleasure or approval. Uh, with me here on the uh, platform, uh, sitting in the middle, is Shiva Balagi, who is currently an International Humanities Fellow at the Brown Kogut Center, where she's working in and around her very, her very extensive uh, teaching duties, unexpected ones, working on a book on Iran's cultural history. Uh, on the far side is Ateka Kaki, a member of the ACLU's National Security Project, who will be telling us about the present joint venture of, uh, with the writer's organization PEN, the Torture Project, and then, of course, nearest to me, our guest of honor, the extraordinary Iranian novelist Sharnoush Parsipur, who will be receiving tomorrow an honorary Doctor of Letters degree from our university. Though all too... Though all too rarely exercised, the principle of free expression is an ancient one, predating by millennia the founding of our own nation but right from the outset, it was a central tenet of that founding. You all remember the First Amendment, the one that underpins all others, what it says. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. It's an amazing sentence, admired around the world, perhaps more than anything else we've said or done, and yet a sentence that we all too often take for granted. But though that constitutional directive has often been ignored or abusively denied or perverted over the subsequent two centuries plus, it is there in plain view, part of us, and thankfully we keep coming back to it and rescuing it whenever it is threatened and our own International Writers Project and this forum our celebrations of it. Freedom of expression is not an uncontroversial idea, of course. There is not a single government in the world that does not at times wish to curb it, and indeed most do, especially in times of crisis, which really turn out to be just about all the time. <laughs> Even those of us who most vigorously espouse it sometimes wish we could make the hate mongers and deceivers shut up. But a free democracy, which our nation, not all the time, but in its best moments, aspires to, cannot survive without it. Democracies, however, as we all know, sometimes misbehave and then hide their misbehavior behind patriotic or religious rhetoric. We'll hear about such misbehavior within our own society later. So where did the International Writers Project come from? Probably the average age of the class of 2010 is 21, which is to say many in this class share a 1989 birthday. 
a turbulent and consequential year, not only for the parents of this class, and a significant one for Brown too. After four, about 14 weeks ago, we passed the 21st anniversary of the 1989 Valentine's Day death sentence by the Iranian leader Ayatollah, Ayatollah Khomeini against the author Salman Rushdie, who was due to speak here at Brown three weeks later. We are also less than a week away from the 21st anniversary of the massacre of the pro-democracy free speech supporters, students mostly, uh, probably about the same average age as our own student body, in Beijing's Tiananmen Square. It was as a direct consequence of these two particular events that Brown's active engagement with freedom of expression issues began by way of offering refuge and support to writers op oppressed by their own societies for the words they wrote. We began that year of 1989-90 by inviting to Brown for a, fellowship, uh, for a fellowship three dissident Chinese writers who had been forced into exile by their pro-democracy activism, two poets, and a novelist. And indeed, our friend the poet Shui Di is still among us, manning the booth there at the back of the stadium, by the auditorium. After seven years, the Freedom to Write program's pockets were empty, but thanks to support from the William H. Donner Foundation, the program was reconstituted in 2003-04 as the International Writers Project, uh, jointly sponsored by Brown's Literary Arts Program and the Watson Institute for International Studies. Its signature program is a series of annual fellowships for distinguished creative writers under threat of life or liberty or forced into exile and whose writing, writings are censored or suppressed. Brown providing them with a safe haven where they can peacefully get on with the writing that is their life's blood. Perhaps only other writers for whom writing is not mere literacy or entertainment or a means to make a living but a solemn vocation can fully understand what it means to be deprived of this freedom. The, it, it's, it's a, uh, the annual fellowships are accompanied in turn by festivals and symposia devoted to the literature, art, culture, and politics of the fellows home region, festivals which include guest speakers, uh, readings, workshops by other writers, panels on current international issues, films, musical and theatrical productions, and art exhibits with a shared national or cultural theme. Many of you have enjoyed these remarkable and unique gatherings here at Brown of great international literary, visual, and musical artists. So our first fellow in 2003-04 was the exiled Iranian novelist Sharnoush Parsifar, a victim of cruelties and punishments, our dear friend Salman, for all the dispiriting anxieties and disruptions of his ordeal, was never forced to suffer. Sharnoush is a national treasure, one of the most distinguished writers of her generation in or out of Iran, and a living model for her younger compatriots and used as such by them. There's probably no single more influential uh, living Iranian author. We have only two of her books in English translation. Women Without Men and Tuba and the Meaning of Night. Uh, the latter, uh, her great epic work uh, and the other, the one that inspired her friend Shirin Neshat to, to produce her new award-winning film of that title, Women Without Men, a film more or less conceived here at Brown that year that Sharnoush was here. And we will now uh, just...
for fun. Take a look at, at uh, let me see if I can get rid of this. A look at a clip of this uh, film, which uh, shows, uh, proves that Charnouche is not only an inspiring writer, but has other talents as well. بیا دخترم میریم با هم سینما گردیش باز این مکی گوستالی گم شد خود تو به جامون میدم شیطان گرفته آره تو چی داره گرفته من این کجاست با کی کار داریم در این کلا میشه سینی آب بولی از این داره زری زری خود تو به جامون اکبر چایی بیا کشنمه یالا زری آهای زری خود تو به جامون مشتری اومده زری دختر چی کار میکنی؟ تو خلایی؟ بپر بیرون میرم تو چی میبافی؟
Zari! Tu mi dici cosa è? Zari! Tu cosa è? Tu in giro hai trovato sul mano? E si è fatto che 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 خیر پیش حسن آقا خیر پیش Is there, 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 there a reason, reason I'm not getting, getting this at all? Yes, it's on. Um, if it comes to your neighborhood, don't miss it. Um, you'll have uh, it in English when you see it. This was a clip loaned to us uh, some years ago when the film was still in production by the filmmaker. Um, and the English uh, translation of Women Without Men and Tuba are both available in the bookstore in very limited quantities, I must say. And immediately after this forum, we will be going over there to meet with customers and staff and Sharnoush will be available to sign copies. Uh, hopefully the world will uh, soon have a third book in translation, that's our hope, uh, of which you've all been given today a small excerpt, or certainly can pick up on your way out, uh, called a Prison Memoir. Um, Sharnoush's history uh, was a very troubled one in her home country. Uh, several times in prison, both by the Shah and then later by um, the revolution, and several times by the latter, and in part because of uh, writing, uh, uh, not in part, entirely because of her writing uh, such as that that lay behind that film clip you just saw. Uh, don't fail to give that little excerpt a read. Uh, you'll understand why uh, this woman is here with us today, and why Brown is honoring her tomorrow. For now, let's uh, listen to a bit of it, be read by Shiva Balagi, and after which, we'll turn the mic over to Shiva to help us put all this in context. Then when Shiva has finished, Sharnoush will have a few words uh, touching on the making of that book and others and her time here, perhaps, at Brown. And then Ateka will tell us about the Penn ACLU torture report. And what, with, with what time remains after that, we'll open the floor to questions from the audience. There are floor mics. So here is Shiva Balagi reading from Sharnush Parsipur's prison memoir. Thank you, Bob, for organizing the program today and for bringing writers like Sharnush Parsipur to our midst here, Brown, and uh, sharing her important words with all of us. The prisoners were all lying down, pressed 
against each other, but surprisingly, they were all awake. Total silence reigned over the unit. The scene seemed unusual. Contrary to all of the times, there was no line at the bathroom door. Instead, several prisoners were gathered next to the heating radiator, and they were taking turns climbing on top of it so that they could look outside. One of them was Iran, another Farzaneh. Both were monarchists. The others belonged to other groups. <clears throat> when I walked out of the bathroom, I saw Iran climb down the radiator. She was shaking all over. Although we were not friends, she took me by the arm and whispered that the bodies of the executed prisoners had been laid out on the side of the courtyard. That night, starting at 11 o'clock, we had heard an ear-splitting noise every few minutes. One of the prisoners had explained that they were building visitors' rooms and that the noise was from the steel beams that were being dropped to the ground. Just then, we heard the same noise again, and Iran, who was in shock, started to tremble even more. I asked her, what is this noise? She answered, heavy machine gun fire. I didn't know what a heavy machine gun was. I left the people who were again climbing upon the radiator to, them, to themselves and walked back to my room. I felt uneasy. Now I was looking more closely at the prisoners. They were lying down with their eyes open and their gaze fixed directly ahead. They were drowned in absolute silence. When I reached my room, Fadi Deh, who was manager of the room across the hall, was standing in the doorway. I asked her, what's going on? She said, it's heavy machine gun fire. Can't you hear it? I asked, what is heavy machine gun fire? She explained that when they carried out mass executions, this was the noise made by the shower of bullets being fired. Then she said everyone was quiet so they could hear the single shots because after each shower of bullets, they delivered a single shot to the head of each prisoner. Everyone in the unit was quiet because they were counting the single shots. So far, they had counted more than 90. Now I too was drowned in deathly silence. Toward the end of November, overcrowding in the prison reached an explosive point. There were more than 350 people crammed in our few cells. Every night, a group of prisoners were forced to stand in a corner because there was not enough room for everyone to sit down. Summary trials and mass executions had become routine. I was tired and disheartened. I felt the weight of all the corpses on my shoulders. In one way, though, I felt happy to be in prison in these treacherous times. I knew that if I were free and did not take any steps to protest the executions, I would have forever hated myself, but the unfolding catastrophe was much bigger than I could, much, much bigger than anything I could do, bigger even than anything a political group could do. In captivity, one is not tormented with these problems, for there is definitely nothing one can do. I knew that when the sad history of these days came to be written down, then at least my role would be clear. From her prison cell, Shahnush Parsipur determined her role was to write. Witnessing and remembering became her prison duty. Her mind became her pen and paper. We could talk today of Parsipur's esteemed place in Persian literature, her pivotal role as a woman writer, transforming the lived history of 20th century Iran into remarkably rich and moving literary texts. But, to, but today, we gather to consider those words she wrote in her mind as her body was confined in Iran's prisons. Prisons that today remain filled with students and professors, journalists and filmmakers, artists and writers. Parsipur's words speak for those who remain drowned in deathly silence. And that silence is shared by each prisoner's lover, mother and daughter, father and son. Draw a map in your mind, connecting the lines between those in prison with their loved ones, walking along Tehran streets, glancing over the waves of the Caspian Sea, crossing over a bridge in Istanbul, gathering in small Persian bookshops in Los Angeles, 
or sitting here in this room. For 10 years, scattered over the span of two decades, my own mother sat in those prison cells Parsipu writes of. My life in high school, college, graduate school, and as a young professor became a split screen, divided between the enriching experiences of learning and teaching at American universities and the darkness of my mother's prison cell. I too remained silent not speaking of this hybrid existence, careful not to write articles that might further endanger my mother, careful not to speak at academic gatherings about controversial topics that might become grist for her warden's rage. Today is the first time I speak publicly as an academic about the prisons in my own life to remind you that Iran's prisons are not a distant darkness. President Ahmadinejad has called those souls imprisoned in Iran today, quote, dust and weeds. This morning, let us allow the dust to settle over our skin, the weeds to bloom in our midst. Parsipur has written of lives lived inside those prison walls. Her words are now our shared responsibility. Yes, I would like uh, to thank all of you that to, you, you came here. Uh, I was in prison four times, and I saw a lot of people, uh, especially uh, the, the uh, yes. It was a very sad experience, this prison. And it continues always in Iran now, at this moment. We have a lot of people that they are in prison and they executed five very young people last week. And uh, they are Kurd, and the Kurd of the Kurd of are a part of Iran. And we Iranians really suffer because they want to to devise my country with this execution and this uh, torture that they make for all, all the people around the Iran. And it's very natural that my works are banned in Iran because the works are all the writers and artists who they have something to tell you is banned in Iran, are banned in Iran. So, I asked the people of the world to defend the people of Iran against this government that they are really cruel. So, I think do you want to take over for a moment and then we'll come back to this question? <coughs> Hello? Well, thanks again, um, as everyone else has said, uh, for inviting me here <clears throat> to be on this panel. It's a real honor um, to be up here with all of you and addressing all of you mm. in the crowd. Um, yes. As Professor Coover mentioned, my name is Atika Kaki, and I work at the American Civil Liberties Union, um, which hopefully most of you in this audience are familiar with. Um, in the days um, after 9-11, the ACLU quickly began to partner with the Pan American Center. And again, as Professor Coover mentioned, uh, the Pan American Center is a fellowship of writers who work to promote and defend uh, freedom of expression around the globe. Um, and I think, you know, it was, it was, became rather clear that now that these abuses uh, began happening in America's name, there was something that we as Americans, as citizens, and as people of conscience needed to do something about it. Um, so over the years, the ACLU and Pan American Center have partnered on a number of um, different projects. We, um, Penn has actually been plaintiff in several ACLU cases, um, including one that uh, recently resulted in a victory, which is 
not something we get to say all that often, but uh, we had challenged the exclusion of Professor Tariq Ramadan, um, who's a leading scholar in the Muslim world, a, a professor at Oxford, had been invited to speak, uh, had actually been um, offered a tenure track position at the University of Notre Dame, and just days before he was um, supposed to arrive in the States, uh, his visa was revoked. And uh, the Pan American Center was one of many US organizations that had invited him to come speak. Um, you know, we talked about the First Amendment, and it, even if people have something controversial to say, that's protect, constitutionally protected speech, and uh, we have the right to sort of engage in person. Um, in January, Secretary Clinton signed an order ending his exclusion, and uh, just last month we welcomed him in New York for his first um, speaking event uh, since he was banned from the country. Um, we also, Penn, Penn was also a plaintiff in a current ACLU lawsuit challenging um, the Bush administration's warrantless wiretapping program. Uh, in, in their work, it is essential for Penn to correspond with writers around the world. And once again, that is, you know, privileged uh, conversations. And so we have grave concerns about the government listening in on uh, international communications. And that's uh, a challenge that is still pending, but hopefully we'll have some good news to report on that front. And then, um, you know, uh, we have also, since, since 2003, the ACLU has been involved in unearthing government documents that would show uh, the depth, the scope, the origins of the Bush administration's torture program. Um, when that lawsuit was first filed under the, rather it was a request filed in 2003 under the Freedom of Information Act, um, I believe that the legal director at the ACLU actually uh, made a bet with the, with the lawyer who filed it saying, I'll give you a dollar a page, thinking that we would never get anything out of this lawsuit. And uh, nearly seven years later, um, the documents total 150,000 pages. Um, I don't know if the bet was ever, you know, sort of, I think it was just kind of still out there, but. Um, so, you know, no doubt, you know, many of you have heard about uh, some of these torture memos, reports written by the Inspector General of the CIA about the legality of uh, the enhanced interrogation techniques used on so-called uh, enemy combatants. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of what we know today is um, due in part to that lawsuit that my colleagues filed years ago, never thinking it would actually sort of, you know, be realized. Um, so we've got this, now we've got 150,000 pages of documents, which is very, very overwhelming. And, um, and although, you know, there have been great reports written, there hasn't been a, sort of a one um, narrative of, of the program that an average person could sit down with and, and read about the origins and um, sort of how it was used over the years and, and sort of think about, you know, why this is bad and why we need accountability for, for these acts that were committed in our name. And so with that in mind, um, the ACLU started a, prog uh, a project called The Torture Report. And actually, we were able to hire uh, Larry Seams, who is the director of the Freedom to Write and International Programs at the Pan American Center, to be the principal author of this report. And it's really remarkable because um, I think that to have a writer, to have someone who can sort of begin to um, deal with some of these documents, with the testimonies, with, um, you know, some ranging from very sort of clinical, removed descriptions of, of you know, the, the way to sort of deal with uh, detainees, um, weave that together with, with narrative of, with testimonials from, from the detainees themselves um, into something that, you know, again, someone could sort of sit down and read. And so the result um, today is, the, as I mentioned, the torture report, which is actually an ongoing project um, that really aims to sort of bring everything that we know uh, through these documents, through testimonies, through press reports into one single narrative. And that is one that is being updated regularly. 
Um, it's being written in phases. We've invited a group of expert contributors to sort of uh, comment on it as it goes, and it's very interesting. As you read it, you can read their comments in line. Um, so, for example, some of these uh, commentators include former interrogators or um, other human rights researchers, um, lawyers who have represented uh, some of the detainees in the military commissions um, set up by the Bush administration um, to sort of offer their critical commentary and also to sort of guide the direction that this report ultimately goes into. Um, so we, we've sort of, uh, Larry has finished writing sort of part one, which um, is four chapters. It's, this is about <laughs> how long it is printed out. Um, uh, I encourage you all, you know, to, to go home and to take a look at it. Um, you can find direct links to the documents and the text. Uh, the month of June is actually Torture Awareness Month, so this is a very timely event. And uh, throughout the month, we'll be featuring a document a day, a again, as a way of sort of encouraging people to begin sort of sitting down with, grappling with, reckoning with um, the abuses that were committed in our name. Um, Similarly, we've also devised a public education program called Reckoning with Torture, um, which pulls together some of these um, documents, as well as, for example, a speech given by President Bush on Torture Survivors Day, June 26, in 2003, uh, saying, you know, the U.S. is committed to holding torturers around the globe accountable. Um, it's kind of ironic, obviously. Um, it also includes uh, video testimony from, from former detainees who, you know, sharing some of their experiences. Um, and we've actually turned it into a program that anyone can download and uh, put on themselves as, again, a way of sort of encouraging people to really come to terms with this and to demand um, a meaningful investigation of the torture program, including um, the senior government officials who authorized, encouraged, uh, and really, you know, sought legal protection for, for these abuses. So I'm going to leave it at that because um, I'm sure we'd all like to hear a little bit more from our guest of honor. See, while, I, if, while I'm speaking, if I can pop, pop up the, the torture report website. Um, I think you can all hear me well enough if I speak up and don't have to hide behind the podium here. Uh, I want to thank all of our uh, panelists, each for their separate approach to what's important here. We do, as uh, International Writers Project, uh, have a... Are you bringing me a mic? <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, yeah. Uh, we do, uh, as, a, um, uh, as, a, as a program here at Brown, the International Writers uh, Project, do keep very close relationships with uh, Penn International. Larry Seams, who was mentioned, has been here almost every single large event that we've had, such as this one. He's in Berlin today, or he would be here with us. And uh, the last time I was in New York at a, a major Penn event, there was a special uh, in Joe's bar, a special night of talking about the torture report is when I got the idea of speaking with Larry that we had to bring uh, more attention to it and this would be a good uh, platform for it. So uh, I, I might be able to, uh, if I can, spot the... I'll work on that in a moment to get up uh, to get up the torture report website, which uh, you mentioned. Do you know it by heart? The What's name, it? the torture report head website address. Oh yeah, it's just uh, www.thetorturereport.org or .com will get you there. Okay, good, great. Um, and uh, it's uh, related so closely to our own program, just from the viewpoint of freedom of expression, that we are. Uh, overcoming what is a kind of effort to keep silent about something that needs to be spoken about. So what I'm going to do now is open the floor mics to anyone who would like to speak with or toward or uh, in any way communicate with our panel, with Shanush or with uh, Shiva or with Alteka. 
the floor marks are available. I might uh, start by uh, asking uh, Shanush uh, about the experience of seeing a film made from her book, uh, and one which incidentally takes place at a time of another bit of American mischief, in this case, the overthrow of a democratically elected government in Iran, that of Mossadegh, uh, and the installation with U.S. connivance of, uh, of a tyrant, the Shah. Uh, and this film takes place at that moment in 1953 when you see the whole film. But, Sharnus, do you want to remark on, on the About making the of the film? Yes. Uh, I was in prison for this uh, book two times. And then the book is banned on Iran. Mrs. Shirin Nishad, the very prominent Iranian artist in New York, he, she's Iranian-American, she decided to make a film by suggestion of um, uh, Ali Dabashi, uh, the professor of uh, Columbia University. And she accepted to make a film from this book. Uh, the process of the film passed for six years because it was a very difficult moment. We needed uh, something very Iranian, and it, was, and it was impossible to go to Iran. So the location is Morocco. Um, and uh, the, the theme of the film uh, was very different. For example, the director was Iranian-American. The film, um, the cameraman was from Austria, the producer from Germany, uh, the artist from Morocco and Iran and other part of the world. So it was a very international job that she has done. And I think after six years, she has made a very good film. The part that you have seen here is different uh, of the original film that uh, now is in the ecran. I don't know where you have the film in, in Providence. So I suggest you, if the, it comes, please go and see it. It's a very good film, and I, I, I'm sure you will enjoy it. Thank you, Sean. Are there any, uh, any uh, questions or any remarks anybody would like to make? I know that lunchtime is fast approaching, and uh, most of us would probably like to get there. As I mentioned, we're going to be going over to the bookstore from here, where Sharnoush will be meeting with, with people who are at the bookstore on the second floor, just above the coffee shop. And uh, we'll be there long enough that if people have books they want signed or other items they want signed, they can do that there. I want to make special thanks to the translator, Sada Khalili, who in very few days managed to put together this uh, little chat book that you all have, or if you don't have, can pick up at any time. And, um, uh, and, and also the... Um, Somebody has a question? We have a question uh, from the floor above. The Carlotta Institute of Pawtucket, Rhode Island, responsible for its production, uh, largely in the person of our own uh, uh, administration uh, assistant in uh, the assistant director of the literary arts program, Gail Nelson. Is Gail here, by the way, still? Yes, can, thank you. No, sorry, Gail? Well, anyway, thanks to him. Yes, please. I am not a political activist, you know. I was, I want, I want never to be a political activist. But the, we have an expression in Persian that the uh, soap of these people has touched every skin. 
I don't know if it has any sense in English. Uh, they, they bother you always, and you naturally, suddenly, you are in front of a political situation. For example, I wrote always uh, in my home, but suddenly I was in prison. They kept me for four years and seven months without any accusation. So naturally, you become a politician or a political activist if they do it like, like this with you. But now also, I am not a political activist. I want some change in Iran. I like to go to Iran and see my family and my, uh, to resolve my problem, to, 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 to touch the people, to contact the Iranian culture, and it's not possible now. Can I comment on that a little bit also? Um, when I was a young girl, I lived half my life in Nashville, Tennessee, where my dad taught at Vanderbilt Medical School, and half my life in Tehran. And um, I thought I was really worldly and smart. When I was 11, I asked for a subscription to Time and Newsweek for my birthday present. And I used to look at the magazines of political events in Central America. And uh, I had this image then, largely shaped by Western photojournalists, that political activists were people who stood on street corners wearing Che Guevara t-shirts and burning tires and kind of spouting political jargon. When uh, the Iranian revolution happened, uh, literally amongst us and around us, what I came to understand is that most of the political prisoners in the world are people who are living their regular, ordinary lives and political circumstances around them change, and their categories become marked as subversive. So your category could be being a woman, being Baha'i, being Jewish, being a writer, and for those reasons alone, for who you are, what you think, what you write, what you do professionally, you become placed in prison, your freedom is taken away, Sometimes you're tortured, sometimes you're executed, and sometimes you're exiled. And we tend to think of people who come from other parts of the world to exile in the United States as being free. In many ways, their bodies are liberated, but they're not free because, in a sense, they're imprisoned outside of their own countries still. And so this, this bifurcation between being a political activist and being a scholar or being a writer is is not a is not a is not an actual bifurcation because in order to be a historian, you know, in order to be a writer, in order to be an artist, you have to assume some sort of political responsibility with in order to be those things. So literature, this is why this book that's going to be published is so critical. It's a prison memoir. It shows how she didn't stop being a writer when she was in prison. And now that she writes, she can't leave behind what she learned and experienced when she was in prison also. And I want to add some words. Uh, for example, I am against the veil, uh, obligation the veil, of the veil. In prison, we had to have the veil, black shadow. So, we didn't like it, but we accepted because they torture you if you do, didn't accept. And the guard of the prison, he came to the room, the racist in there. The prison warden. And he told, ha, 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 look at this black cross. I was really angry because we didn't decide to have this uh, black shadow. They put on our head with force and not they ridiculize us. So naturally you, you do as a political activist. You quarrel with them, you fight for your freedom. Please.
Okay, I understand what do you mean. Okay. Uh, I want to tell you something first. Iran is a very ancient country. Iran, Afghanistan, and other countries like this. They are more than 6,000 years old. So their th the, the way of, the, of their thinking is something very ancient. Uh, we are the Adamic uh, People of the earth. People of the earth. We have made by mood by uh, God. But the Americans are a mechanical type of people. <laughs> you have made by your job, your work, your invention, your discoveries. So you are a little heavy for other people of other part of the world. Because at that part of the world, we are waiting always that God does something. Here, you do something, okay? And so your force bother other people. But at the same time, you, it's the time, your time. You are around the world. Uh, as an Iranian American, I am American also now, I think, okay, it's the time of the Americans. It was a moment that the Iranian empire walked around the world, or the Roman empire. Now it's the American, the, the time of the Americans. Not we must accept, but we must try to understand the Americans and the way of life in America. Uh, it's a very difficult to explain it clearly, but don't be worried about the reaction of the other part of the world. If even you don't touch them, they are angry ang against you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Is there, is there she, no she, other? She uh, has a question. Oh, sorry. Yes. That, that may be. I have a question for Shiva, and that is this is the first time you've spoken out, you said, and what is different now for you? Well, it's the first time I've spoken about my mother being a prisoner at, in an academic forum. And um, when I say that people who come to the United States in exile are not necessarily free, it's because um, you worry. Professors and scholars are supposed to be objective. And if I speak about the fact that I have personal connections to Iran, that has potential career ramifications. So that the American expectations of what exiled peoples from the third world should be like create their own kinds of silences. Um, if I don't speak out about it, people look at me and say, well, she's cute. She speaks fluent English. She's probably from a good family. She's probably one of those wealthy exiles who left and is untouched and disconnected. So the silence also contains certain prejudices because people think I'm inauthentic when I speak about Iran. I don't understand about problems in Iran. I'm disconnected from Iran. And so part of the reason why I decided to speak out is to say, you know, when we talk about scholars of the Holocaust, and someone is a historian of the Holocaust, and they talk about writing a book about the village that their ancestors came from, we don't hold it against that person. Rather, we say that person has a certain empathy, has a certain personal connection, and has assumed a certain responsibility to dedicate their lives to learning about in teaching and writing about the history of a very important tragic moment in history. And so when I was asked to speak today, I thought, you know, I, could, I, can, I can speak for a half hour about the importance of Shahnaj Pasipur as a literary figure because she's a tremendous literary figure. She's 
produced what are masterpieces of contemporary literature. But she, she writes about her personal experiences of being in prison, and that's a very difficult thing to do. It's a painful part of you that you carry inside you that you don't really want to share with other people. You know, I don't want to be at a cocktail party enjoying my time and have someone come and say, oh, so let, tell me about your mother's experience. You know, once you put it out there, it's no longer your own, and it can come back to you in different ways and settings. But I realized, you know, it's, I, I took courage from her words. You know, if she is able to write under the circumstances of being in prison and to publish and translate under the circumstances that are so difficult for Iranian writers living in the United States, then who am I to stay silent? It's time to speak out. And if you're wondering what you should do, yes, with your morning coffee, go to the torture papers and read them uh, so that your country, the United States, can be different from Iran and not be a place that prisons and tortures people. But another thing that you can do is to take the time to honor Shahnush Parsipur by reading her books. That's probably the most important thing anyone in this room can do. This is a lead into what I was sort of wondering whether I would be appropriate to ask. But could you talk a little bit about Tuba? Because she, I, I don't really know the whole film because I only saw that little excerpt and you say it's a little bit different now. But the young woman whose name I couldn't catch, Shari, reminded me of the young Tuba. Hmm. Well, it's not just that this is made from another book, from Women Without Men, but I understand what you're saying, I, that, that I there's understand. a comparison between that character and the, the, the beginning about, part of Tuba. about these women who have heightened sensitivity and, and what happens to them. And if you could just speak a minute about that, because Tuba, if you haven't read Tuba and the Meaning of Night, you must. It's an amazing book. Good, thank, you. thank you very much. I wrote Tuba in, the, in prison. Uh, because uh, it was a moment I, I understand, I understood that they don't release me. They didn't release me. So I tried to write. And I wrote in prison, but after a while I tore it. Tore it? Mm -hmm. tore it up. Because it was impossible to bring it uh, out. And I really wrote it in, out of prison. Uh, this is a book that I tried to find a Iranian woman figure for the hundred years or a, a, a moment that the revolution of Iran, the Islamic revolution has begun. I wanted to show what's the meaning of this woman in this part of the world and what is her, her characteristics. So it's not bad if you read it because you can find something about Iran and Iranian culture. Yes. <laughs> I might say this, that uh, Tuba in the Meaning of Night, it's, it is a, an epic work, and uh, she mentioned the word 100 years. I kind of myself rank it with uh, books like 100 Years of Solitude and Midnight's Children. It has that uh, breadth and has that uh, depth of sensi sensibility, so very much a, a, a highly recommended text. I think we'll. Uh, I think I think I'll close with um, um, uh, just a little quote from our our friend uh, Don DeLillo. Uh, who, who is there? Another question? Did I hear somebody. Ask? No. Um, who said a writer's freedom of expression is synonymous with his right to live. Writing is more than a profession and a duty. It is a writer's life blood. And when the state denies the free flow of language and ideas, it defines itself in important ways in the eyes of the world. The more nearly the total the state, the more vivid and living 
is the imprisoned writer. I want to thank all of our persons here. We're headed to the bookshop. Thank you.